both of those locations. So let's officially get started. Welcome everybody, excited to have you in class today. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And I'm here in class today with Tom Donnelly, one of our top scholars at the center. And he's gonna walk us through light speed through the civil rights movement. But this is my favorite class because we get to find out all about the civil rights movement from the Declaration to Modern Times. We get to meet these great organizations that did so much work to make change happen in our country. And we dive into all the people behind those organizations, behind the court cases, and behind that great change. So, so much to do, so many questions that we always have for these classes. Tom, I know you're gonna cover all of it, but is there one kind of big key, big idea takeaway you wanna kick us off with before we dive in? No, let's, 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 just get, let's get rolling. Let's get rolling, okay. So big idea around the civil rights movement. It's going to begin our storytelling today with what we think is really essential to understanding the 1950s and 60s civil rights movement. You need to understand the organizations and the people behind it because they did this work at every level. So Tom, why don't you kick us off with this and we'll start with the NAACP. Yeah, it's true. So there's so many different groups, so many different people. And I mean, I think as we go through the groups, one thing to notice is that the civil rights movement lasted longer than just the 50s and 60s. That's usually what we think of with the civil rights movement, but the advocacy went decades upon decades and even centuries before then. Uh, but the first big group we wanna talk about is the NAACP. It's founded in 1909. Here we see its inspiring mission on the screen. It was to promote equality of rights and eradicate caste or race prejudice among citizens of the United States. So that's equality at the ballot box, in the courts, in the schools, at work, and then we can see that inspiring mission in the final words there. They wanted complete equality before the law. The end of Lacey Pre brings together many really, really important key figures. One is Ida B. Wells. And so she's a courageous journalist, uh, civil rights figure. She studied white violence in the South in the late 1890s through the early 1900s. So a lot of what we know about violence against African-Americans in the South during this period came from Ida B. Wells' courageous work. There's also W.E.B. Du Bois, who is one of the great intellectuals in American history. He's the first African-American to earn a PhD at Harvard. He wrote a landmark work about Reconstruction, that period after the Civil War. It was entitled Black Reconstruction. Curry has it right there. Uh, and you know what's so cool about that book is that Du Bois places African-Americans at the center of the Reconstruction story, so I really can't recommend it enough. Two other key figures in the NAACP were Mary White Ovington, who was a suffragist and a journalist, and also Moorfield Story, who was a lawyer from Boston and the founding president of the organization from 1909 to 1929. So that's a big one. And the next group that we want to introduce you to, if you don't already know them, you may already, is the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Yeah, so this is the organization most often associated with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It was formed in 1957. And you know, it's big principle was nonviolence. So that's a central tenet as they were on, they, they wanted to protest, but they used nonviolence. So again, Dr. King is the most famous figure um, associated with this particular group, but there's so many other great ones. There's Ella Baker, who had a, a five decade long career in the civil rights movement. She was more of a behind the scenes uh, 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 organizer, but she really pushed the civil rights movement to do two big things. One was to ensure that it was a grassroots organization, not just one that's top down, but that was also one that was from the bottom up. The other was that she pushed hard to ensure that there were women in positions of leadership in the civil rights movement to make sure we had people of, 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 of all races, all genders, all creeds being active in this important movement. There's also Ralph Abernathy, who was a Baptist minister, a close friend of Dr. King. He worked with King on the Montgomery bus boycott and he became the president of this organization after Dr. King's tragic assassination. And finally, there's Fred Shuttlesworth, who was a minister from Birmingham, and he was also a key ally of Dr. King. And then finally, we also have Bayard Rustin, who is this amazing, he was both a theorist and a real practical operator. And so he was a trailblazer of nonviolent direct action. He taught Dr. King those key principles, but he helped organize big things like the Freedom Rides and also the March on Washington. Logistical mastermind of the civil rights movement is what I was told he was, and then digging into it, he absolutely was. Now, another group, Congress, Congress for Racial Equality. 
Um, and you always remind me, just call him Core Curry. It's easier to say. <laughs> so tell us about Core. Yeah, so Core was founded in 1942. You could see her on the screen. It had a broad vision of equality for all people, regardless of race, creed, sex, age, disability, sexual orientation, religion, or ethnic background. Um, you know, some of the key players here were James Farmer, who, again, he was committed to nonviolence. He organized the first Freedom Ride. George Hauser, who was a Methodist minister, and Bernice Fisher, who was based in Chicago and known as the godmother of the sit-in movement. Next group is the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights. Sure, and so this is also known as LCCR. It was founded in 1950, and their big role, they played a big role at the national level. And so you think of the civil rights movement, you think of big laws, like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. LCCR was the main organizer of those activities in Washington, D.C., and this still plays a similar huge role in the civil rights movement today. So who are some of the, the key figures for LCCR? There's Roy Wilkins, who was active from the 1930s all the way up to the 1970s. There's A. Philip Randolph, who was an important labor organizer. And then there's Arnold Aronson, who was the executive secretary of the group from 1950 to 1980. He worked with, uh, with Randolph to lobby FDR to include protections for African-Americans as part of the New Deal. And he helped to plan the March on Washington. Awesome. Now, I love that we're going back to Ella Baker and looking at her again and really reminding ourselves that the civil rights movement is a movement that spans all the ages. And we'll talk about that again later, but it's a very young movement as well. And Ella Baker has a lot to do with this and the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee. Yes, also known as SNCC, which is easier to say, uh, but it, rep it represents a, a changing of the generational guard in the civil rights movement. These are the young members of the civil rights movement. It's formed in 1960. It grows out of the sit-in movement. And you're right, Curry, Ella Baker plays a key role here in bringing together SNCC. And she wanted to make sure the organization focused on two big things. One was ensuring that they still worked with direct action, nonviolent direct action, but also she urged them not to forget about the importance of voting. And so she really made voter registration a key part of what SNCC was organizing around. She helped support and teach many, many members of the leadership here in SNCC, including Diane Nash, Julian Bond, John Lewis, Stokely Carmichael, Bob Moses, Bernice Johnson, Reagan. So we see just a, a variety of young, young people engaged in the civil rights movement, and many of them would remain engaged in the civil rights movement for decades upon decades and for the rest of their lives. And you're going to see these players kind of move around and do different work and be in different action moments as we go through as well. So remember these names as we look at Diane Nash, we look at John Lewis is going to come up over and over again. Um, and so major players and very young faces as well. Now we're diving into the next group is the Committee for Equal Justice. And these are, you know, some two f very famous women as well. <laughs> Yeah, so th this is an organization founded in 1944 by Rosa Parks and by Recy Taylor. It was meant to focus on African-American women. Rosa Parks most famous for refusing to give up her seat on the bus, uh, but also she was an active member of the civil rights movement for years upon years. She was a secretary of the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP for 14 years. And then we have Recy Taylor who was raised in the Jim Crow South in Alabama and both of them joined together in this committee for equal justice to try to draw attention in particular to violence against African-American women. Yeah, and I think that's unbelievably powerful. The work that Rosa Parks does into really telling the story of the continuous violence against African-American women at this time and fighting to ensure that justice is held for those women is huge. She is the, she is the bus and that movement and so much more. So we see these people in new light when we dig into all the work that they've done. Um, now one kind of, this is kind of a group, but outside of what you normally would think of. So let's talk real quick before we jump out of the groups and talk about the Warren Court and how that became a key factor in changing a, in civil rights. Sure, so the Warren Court, it's the Supreme Court that runs from 1953 to 1969. It's named after that figure you see right there on the screen, Chief Justice Earl Warren. It plays a key role throughout the civil rights era. This is the court that brings us Brown versus the Board of Education declaring school segregation unconstitutional, loving v. Virginia, striking down laws that kept people, African-Americans and white Americans from marrying. It was, in, during this period, it was really a key ally of the civil rights movement. And this was very different than the role that the Supreme Court played in many other periods in American history. It's really with the Warren Court that we see this vision of the Supreme Court 
and its role at protecting in particular minority rights. So this is pushing for equality, it's protecting individual rights, but it's especially protecting unpopular groups, groups like African-Americans who are very unpopular in many parts of the country, ensuring that they receive the full promise of the constitution as well. Full promise of the constitution, full promise of the declaration. So let's take a minute and kind of go back to these founding documents and look at the civil rights movement over our entire American history. So, you know, it begins with, you know, simple words that all men are created equal. That's a promise in that declaration. And what do we see through the declaration and then into the constitution, which are areas and values and law that people can call to and say, no, 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 you said that, now let's live up to it. Yeah, so the Declaration of Independence, it has those famous words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Through most American history, we've thought of this as America's founding creed. These are the ideals that we try to live up to. Of course, we know even when the Declaration is issued, we already had the institution of slavery in the United States, but there's a way in which these principles of freedom and equality, they're written into our nation's DNA. And it's no accident that as civil rights reformers from the very beginning of the nation, all the way through the civil rights movement and beyond, that those reformers have drawn on these principles and these words to push for reform, to try to transform America, to try to transform the constitution, to try to get the nation to live up to its best ideals. And so again, this starts right after the Declaration of Independence. Think of 1777 and a figure like Prince Hall, He's a free African-American in Massachusetts. He reads the declaration. He petitions the Massachusetts legislature and says, Massachusetts legislature, you must abolish slavery. It's inconsistent with the Declaration of Independence and with natural law. And we see similar arguments resonating as we get into the 1800s with key figures like Frederick Douglass. Again, using the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution to ask his white audiences to live up to the words of their founding creed and its promise of freedom and equality for everyone. And furthermore, fast forwarding ahead into the 20th century. This is at the absolute core of one of the most famous speeches of the civil rights movement, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington, where he describes the Declaration of Independence and our constitution as a promissory note issued to all Americans, regardless of their race. And so the big idea here is that the Declaration of Independence and the constitution, they write key principles like freedom and equality into our nation's DNA, but it would take decades upon decades, even centuries of advocacy by, uh, by countless reformers showing courage, showing brilliance, showing wisdom, willing to challenge the, the, the status quo and popular opinion to try to push America to live up to its founding principles. And so that's the story we'll tell today with the rest of the civil rights movement. Yeah, and I think that's unbelievably huge and powerful. And it's this, this idea, and Tom, I love the way you say it, that it's you know, putting the idea of equality, it's written into our DNA as a country. You just, we need to tap into those genes to tap into that DNA. And we look at the constitution that begins with this idea of we the people, and what does that mean? And how do we fulfill it? But really empowers us with this reconstruction time period when these three big amendments are written into the constitution. They're not kidding anymore. Now they're gonna take that declaration and really put it into the Constitution. And that kind of kicks off our storyline here and the continued fight for freedom and equality of civil rights. So walk us through this reconstruction time period, what it does and how it changes the Constitution. And then we can dive into, you know, the beginning of African-Americans voting in our country and this moment of interracial democracy. Absolutely. So after the Civil War, we try to write new constitutional baselines into our Constitution. We try to set new baselines for post-Civil War America. It's these three amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. The 13th Amendment ratified in 1865, abolishes slavery. The 14th Amendment ratified in 1868, wrote the Declaration of Independence's promise of freedom and equality into the Constitution. And the 15th Amendment ratified in 1870, banned racial discrimination and voting. What's amazing, Curry, is that for a brief period, these amendments combined with the political leadership at the time and the act activism of the African-American community led us to this amazing period of multiracial democracy in America, where African-Americans vote in massive numbers, where they hold office in huge numbers, all the way from US Senator down to local sheriff and justice of the peace. And we see a national government willing to enforce the constitutional rights of African-Americans and of all Americans. 
But this was all too brief a period. And after this, this, this period of multiracial democracy, we unfortunately see its collapse, the rise of Jim, the Jim Crow system in the South, which would then use a combination of violence, intimidation, and laws to turn African-Americans into second-class citizens throughout the South, where we would see them kept from the ballot box, but also forced to endure separation in schools. They had to drink from different water fountains, use different restrooms, travel in different train cars, et cetera. Although, and so the system's in place. And the question becomes, in the case of Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, so less than three decades after the ratification of the 14th Amendment, the Supreme Court's asked, does this system of Jim Crow segregation violate the Constitution? The 14th Amendment writes a promise of equality into the Constitution. Does this system of Jim Crow segregation violate it? And the Supreme Court in a seven to one decision says, no, Jim Crow is constitutional that this system does not violate the 14th Amendment. A system of separate but equal is constitutional. You can separate African-Americans from white Americans as long as those facilities are equal. It's a seven to one ruling. But the one is very important. There's a powerful dissent by Justice John Marshall Harlan who calls the Supreme Court to task and calls to the Supreme Court to really realize the 14th Amendment's promise of equality, but it would take another another over 50 years for us to even to, 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 uh, to reject Plessy v. Ferguson and move towards a more free and equal America. And, and I think that's so, it, it's so amazing that we get those amendments in. And then it's such a tragedy that there's the pullback and not following through. And then the courts do that as well. It's not just the people in the country or the people in the South. It is the society and the courts that pull back and we see this lone descent, but you're right, 50 years. So you have people like Reese Taylor growing up in this and living through this. And then the civil rights movement of modern time really takes hold and starts really t taking charge in the, 1940, the early 1900s, but kicks it in the 1940s. And that brings us back to the NAACP trying to overturn Plessy and saying that was wrong. That was bad law to begin with. Let's fix this, let's fight the fight. This is a huge fight that takes so many years, so many players, and so many families with young children being put on the line to ensure that all children get the right to an education that is fair, equal, and together. Yeah, I mean, what's, what's so, there are many very cool things about the civil rights movement, but one of the really cool things is you see both inside the courts and outside the courts, civil rights advocates looking to those reconstruction amendments looking to the Declaration of Independence and saying, Jim Crow system, you are inconsistent with what written into the Constitution, what was written into the Declaration of Independence. And so reformers, again, laying claim to the core of America's creed to attack the system of Jim Crow. It's this team here at the NAACP that comes up with a strategy inside the courts. So it's Thurgood Marshall, Charles Hamilton Houston, William Hastie, all associated with Howard Law School in Washington, DC, come together with a strategy for how they're going to chip away at Plessy v. Ferguson, Jim Crow, and separate but equal over time. Their strategy, case by case, they win, they win cases, you know, leading up all the way to the culmination, the big case, the one that's most famous of all, Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. And so there, after winning some, some cases leading up to it, they decide we're gonna go right at the core, right at the heart of Jim Crow segregation, this entire system, and that's segregation in public schools. We saw the picture there of Linda Brown who was a third grader. She was the third grader. She and her parents are the Brown of Brown versus Board of Education. What did they want? They just wanted Linda Brown to go to her local school, the Sumner School in Topeka, Kansas. The local school said, no, 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 Linda, you can't come here. You know why? Because this school is only for white students. And so Linda Brown and her parents go to court. They challenge these laws. They say, the, for, this, the, the system of school segregation where we're separating white students from African-American students is unconstitutional. They come to the court, it comes to the Warren Court, the court of just, just, uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren. And in the end, the Supreme Court in a unanimous decision says we were wrong. Plessy v. Ferguson was wrong. Plessy v. Ferguson was wrong on the day it was decided. Linda Brown, you're right. This system of school segregation violates the 14th Amendment's promise of equality, it's unconstitutional. And here's the powerful words from Chief Justice Warren. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. And so there we see this powerful vision of equality finally being realized in the 14th Amendment. But again, it grows out of this long-term strategy by the NAACP 
Marshall, Houston, and Hasty. Now, when we think about this, you know, and I, I, you know, teaching students this all the time, they're like, okay, Brown versus Board of Ed, great, awesome, win, check. And that's not really what happens. Um, just like all the stories, there's huge struggle and there's huge push to get the ideas and the values and the theories that the court comes out with into play. And so that brings us back to the students and back to the children in so much of this fight going in and desegregating the schools. Now they're not alone, their families are with them, but sometimes the communities are not with them. Sometimes the government of their state and their cities are not with them. So can you kind of help tell us how it went from Brown in the courtroom to Brown in the schools? Yeah, so Brown's in 1954. What we see right afterwards are many, many white Southerners lead a movement of what they call massive resistance to Brown versus Board of Education. So these are, these are political leaders, these are school officials doing everything possible to prevent this, the desegregation of their schools. And so this happens across the country, it's you know, sort of across the South. Um, but what we see is it, it comes to a crisis point in 1957 in Little Rock, Arkansas. There are nine African-American students, the Little Rock Nine attempt to enroll at the all-white Central High School. Governor or Orville Faubus called out the National Guard to bar them with support from white mobs. And what happens? President Dwight D. Eisenhower sends 1,000 federal troops. He nationalizes the Arkansas National Guard to protect the African-American students. And in a powerful speech, uh, Eisenhower ends up defending this decision, explaining it to the nation. And then finally, the Warren Court steps in a year after to reinforce Eisenhower's actions in Cooper v. Aaron. There, the court explains to state officers and governors that they had a duty to, to obey orders of the Supreme Court. They may not like the orders, but in the end, they had to obey. And Curry, the big lesson here, and we learned it over and over again during the civil rights movement, is that to push for big change, you know, it often result, it often requires, you know, advocacy outside of the courts by key movement leaders, strategy inside the courts by lawyers aligned with the movement, big court decisions like Brown versus Board of Education, but also actions by elected officials. So by the president of the United States enforcing a court's decision and by members of Congress in using the powers that Congress gets from the reconstruction amendments to realize their promise to pass big laws that promote freedom and equality in America. So it often takes all of these things firing in the same direction, all these institutions and people and organizations and all of that to bring about big constitutional change. And like, that's amazing and sad at the same time. <laughs> like, just be honest, like, so you, like, it's a perfect storm. Like, it's a perfect storm of all these factors working together to make this change. But at the same time, it had to take all these factors working together at the same time to make that change. Because when Plessy fought, Homer Plessy fought years ago, the courts weren't with them and the change did not happen separate but equal happened. So just, you know, seeing that on both sides of it, but, you know, going back to, cause we're at least I'm internally optimistic at all times, going back to so much work in the ground, on the ground level by all of these players to ensure that the people of the country saw what was really going on in their face directly and also were voicing to their public figures. Um, and so we begin with the Montgomery County bus boycott and the huge, huge, you know, when you said earlier that these people in the civil rights movement put themselves both morally and physically in harm's way, they, they pushed for what was right. They were attacked violently at times, but also their families that, you know, the boycott affects families for almost a year. You can't get to work. If you're a part of the boy, boycott, you could be in jail and lose your job. So this is huge and it's not short term, it's long term. So tell us about the, the boycotts and then we'll roll into the sit-ins. Yeah, so this is famously uh, involves Rosa Parks, December 1st, 1955, refusing to give up her seat to a white man on a bus. She's arrested for violating the law, but it's part of a broader strategy in Montgomery because Parks herself is where he said, she's a longtime member of the NAACP and her, her arrest and her actions becomes a galvanizing force for the African-American community's challenge to segregated buses in Montgomery, Alabama. They but that Montgomery is one of the most segregated cities in the entire nation, and they boycott the bus system. And you're right, Curry, it's not just a they boycotted it for a day or a week or you know a couple weeks. It's for over a year. People had to walk from their houses to the stores, to their work, to school. It was their primary mode of transportation. And so it's a great personal sacrifice that they pushed for change in their own community. 
Um, and next, we talk about the sit-in movement, which, I, you know, diving deep into this, like looking at the four students who were in a college lo- very close to this, this lunch counter and said, we can't, we can't sit around anymore. They're 18 and 19-year-olds. And they, go, they leave their college dorm and they go to the counter and they sit down and they refuse to move, putting themselves in harm's way. And this spreads across the sit-in movement and moves people forward and saying each of us can take steps to do this. And Patricia points out in the chat that this action by these African-American students makes change for everyone. It rises all boats in all communities, white, black. Um, Colin pointed out in other communities looking at Japanese Americans as well. So really, really powerful work by students. So talk about the sit-in mo- the student sit-in movement and then we'll go to the Freedom Riders. Yes, yeah, so it's another classic example of nonviolent direct action. It emerges in 1960, beginning in Greensboro, North Carolina. It spreads to other big cities like Nashville, Atlanta, and as part of the sit-in movement, student activists. And again, Curry, these are such, these are young students. The, the amount of courage it takes to do this is just like, it's mind-boggling. It's, it's inspiring. And so student activists enter a segregated public place like a grocery counter like you see here. They sit in the whites-only area. And then they'd remain seated, even as white mobs surround them, even as those mobs threaten them, harass them, physically assault them. And the idea here through nonviolent direct action is that you don't respond with violence. Instead, you, re- you, you, you violate the, the law, you, you respond to the violence with peace. And what it's meant to do is expose the amount of coercion that's meant to enforce unjust Jim Crow laws. And it's meant to show that you are you know, you're, you're on the side of good and the people and the violent ones are on the side of constitutional evil. And I love that you said that because there's so much, again, strategy, strategy, strategy. I feel like I can't say that enough today. So if you look at the students and we're going to go to the Freedom Riders next, you look at the students, you look <laughs> at what they're wearing, you look at James Meredith fighting for desegregating the universities. You know, we, ha- we teach police officers across the country. And the number one thing they say when they first look at some of these images, they go, they're really well dressed. Was that just the time period? And the answer is no, they're oh. not. Because they wanted to show the world we are good, upstanding citizens at every age. And so when we go to protests, we're nonviolent and that we wear our Sunday best because that's what you wore to church on Sunday. So you showed up to protest that way. So you know you could show people that you were good, outstanding community members as well. So, so many factors in this were thought out, so detailed, and so meticulous to ensure change. So next to the Freedom Riders who would drive south and really push for that change at the ballot box. So, so much of these, these bus tours down to desegregate bus stations in the south, but also to register people to vote because when you had the vote, you could vote out governors that le- believed in stump speeches in Birmingham, Alabama, that said segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever, if you had the ability to vote. So tell us about the Freedom Riders, and then we'll roll into the Children's March. Yeah, so it's 1961. It's organized by CORE, one of those groups we talked about at the beginning. And again, these are civil rights movement activists boarding buses in the North that are driving South, and they know as they do this as they're working to desegregate the buses, the bus stations, and as they're gonna eventually push for the right to vote, they know that they're going to be met with violence when they get there. So again, the amount of bodily courage it takes to not only believe in principle, but really to be willing to put your body on the line. I never, I I try to never lose sight of that as part of all of these um, acts of nonviolent direct action. And what happens, they're met by white mobs. Some of the buses are bombed. And many of these images, they'll find their way into the homes of Americans nationwide. And many white Americans see these images and they express horror. And it begins, you know, all of these actions are part of a larger strategy to reshape public opinion more broadly. So that even white Americans, many white Americans who may have been either lukewarm or even against the push for civil rights reform become more sympathetic as they see these images of violence and lawlessness. And I think it is fascinating to realize this is the same time period that TVs are becoming common in people's homes. Not like super common, but like somebody in your neighborhood would probably have a TV. Um, So this is all like layering into this moment in time. So we go to the Children's March next. And again, when we think about this, and I try to pull these images so you could see how little these kids are at this march. Because, you know, you're amazed at their heroism, and then you cry that a child had to do this to make our country live up to its ideals. 
But these are young children because their parents are in jail, because their parents are losing their jobs and have to work. The children march begins and they are turned on with fire hoses. But there's also this image of this young marcher right here. And if there isn't a stronger visual of a powerful child making change, walking up to that dog who's about to attack her and saying, oh, no, we're fighting for justice here. So tell us about the Children's March and then, you know, the powerful words of MLK. Yeah, so this is a mass demonstration in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. And I think, again, you're right, Curry, that the things that are notable here on the one hand, the courage of the children that are marching and the other civil rights activists that are there kind of counterpoise with the violence that we see from the local authorities there in Birmingham, Alabama. Bull Connor, the city's police commissioner, orders the city's police to meet the marchers with violent force. So we see starling dogs, which you can see in the image there, cattle prods, fire hoses, just brutal, brutal violence. And it's again, caught on television cameras, caught through photographs and telecast throughout the United States. Many white Americans are appalled. Growing out of this activism in Birmingham, Alabama, we also get one of the great works in American political thought, one of the great works in all of American history authored by Dr. Martin Luther King, who was arrested as part of the activities in Birmingham. And he writes his famous letter from a Birmingham jail. His audience there, interesting is, he's writing to white moderate ministers. And so the white moderate ministers look to Dr. King and they criticize him and the civil rights movement saying, aren't you going a little too far? Every time you bring your protests, it brings violence and disorder. Don't you need to cool down? And Dr. King explains in return that really the only way we're going to make progress, what we've learned over time, oppressors will only give up power when they're challenged. And what Dr. King teaches in the letter from a Birmingham jail is that we're going to use nonviolent direct action. We're going to violate unjust laws lovingly, openly. We're going to take the consequences. But in the end, through that, expose their injustice and hopefully change hearts and minds and make America better. And I know we're like fast forwarding now pretty quickly into these unbelievable moments, but that leads us to the March on Washington, which is the largest march, uh, largest march and peaceful march on Washington up until this moment in America. Um, it's, it's something like 700,000, 750,000 people march on Washington. Um, and then we lead to the I Have a Dream speech on that day that moves powerful movement. John Lewis speaks on that day as well. And that brings us to Congress finally utilizing those that power that it is given in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to make law to enforce the equality and the voting, uh, voting rights for at least African-American males, but African-American women as well after the 19th. So could you talk to us a little bit about the Civil Rights Act and then the Voting Rights Act as well? Absolutely. So we have this, this March on Washington, this famous speech, the I Have a Dream speech by Dr. King, but it's not like everything changed directly right after that. So we see later in 1963, we see President Kennedy himself is assassinated. Uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson becomes president and he pledges to push for a civil rights bill. So here we finally have a president, a Congress and a movement all acting as one. And it would take a lot of work, a lot of lobbying, overcoming filibusters by people who oppose this legislation. But in the end, Congress passes the Civil Rights Act of 1964, one of the biggest pieces of legislation ever passed by Congress. And what it does is it promotes, it attacks racial discrimination in various settings at work, in schools, in public settings like restaurants and hotels. And what we would see is shortly after Congress passes the Civil Rights Act, it ends up before the Supreme Court. And again, the Warren Court in a pair of landmark decisions, part of Atlanta Motel and Katzenbach versus McClung, they say this may be a big new piece of legislation, but it's constitutional. And so backing it and giving it the power that it needs. Um, and this leads us, you know, it's, it's not a straight shot from here on like that. You know, you think, oh, we finally like hurdled again. And nope, not a straight shot again. And that leads us to Bloody Sunday, um, which we look at John Lewis um, and pushing for voting rights. You know, you this, this is a small town in Alabama. Um, the civil rights movement gathers in this small town in Selma, Alabama. This is just a few weeks after Jimmy Lee Jackson is murdered by Alabama State Trooper when leaving a nighttime vigil with his grandparents. Um, and there is a movement and kind of a split in the civil rights movement. And there are some civil rights members, John Lewis included, that are ready to push a little harder, not to violence, but push it a little harder and break some laws because they're not seeing these changes happen because they're seeing this government in the South not be able to be changed because people can't vote 
they can't even register to vote because they're blocked over and over again. So tell us, get us from Selma, Alabama to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And then we're going to wrap up, I swear. (laughs) Yeah, so even after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Civil Rights Movement realizes, no, we still need political power. So they focus on the vote. It culminates in Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama. There, the Civil Rights leaders, they call for a march from Selma, Alabama to the state capital in Montgomery, Alabama. It draws 600 marchers, leave Selma. They cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. They're greeted by state troopers and the state troopers with tear gas, with clubs, meet the civil rights protesters, these peaceful protesters with violence. You see John Lewis right there, right? In the, right you, you, yeah, Curry, I'll show you where he, he's right there. He would bear the scars of that day for the rest of his life. Once again, powerful images are captured by television cameras, by photographs. Again, it became known as Bloody Sunday. It ends up culminating though in one of the great pieces of legislation ever passed by Congress, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It's passed under under Congress's powers under the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment, especially the 15th Amendment's ban on racial discrimination in voting. It's a powerful law, it requires One of the big provisions is known as preclearance, where it says, if you have a lousy track record on African-American voting, we are going to look closely at what you do. And when you when you pass new voting laws, you have to come to the national government and the national government can say yes or no. So this is a very different way than the Constitution traditionally worked. Usually voting laws were the product of state and local laws. Here, Congress is taking on a bigger role in voting, using its power under the Reconstruction Amendments. This this law then ends up before the Supreme Court in a case called South Carolina v. Katzenbach. And there, in in an opinion by Chief Justice Earl Warren, Warren says, this is a big law. It's it's strong constitutional medicine, but despite that, it is constitutional. It is consistent with the powers that Congress gets through the 14th and 15th Amendments. And practically speaking, the law made a huge change. It really worked. Look, in 1960, only 20% of eligible African-Americans were registered to vote. By 1971, just a little over a decade later, the number had risen from six to 62%, 20% to 62% in roughly a decade. At the same time, African-American office holders quadrupled from 1,400 in 1970 to 4,900 in 1980 and doubling again by the early 1990s. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. We know this story doesn't end in 1965 and the conversation about voting rights Um, continues. On the first week of April, we're doing a class that's going to look at the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, and voting rights in America. Next week, we're going to look at women's right to vote and the conversation and stories around the women's fight for equality and voting and how that is defined on base of race as well. So lots of pieces of this, lots of stories. Tom, thank you so much for walking us through all of this. As of right now, I am going to wrap up class, but there's a few questions. So everybody hold tight if you can stay with us for a minute. Thanks, everyone.